Hey everyone, and welcome back to our X Marathon in the second video of many, where we are covering X2 X Men United, the second film in the X Men franchises. And with me today, I have. Hello, it's me, Emily. You may know me from the previous X Men Festival Marathon, X Marathon, that's what we're calling it, video. You may also know me. X Festival. X Men. It's yeah, X Fun. I used to be a fan, but now I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may also know me from a multitude of other videos on this channel. Um, some of my favorites include the um, unbearable weight of talent that that Nicolas Cage movie video, <laughs> or the uh, best and worst of 2023. Those are both pretty good videos, and you should go watch them after you watch wish <laughs> after you watch this one. Do you need a minute? <laughs> are you having a stroke? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. But yeah, X two. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a good movie, Max. I like this one. I really like this one. I was shocked how good this was. Like, what a yep. genuinely fun comic book movie that still holds up. Yeah. These movies hold up. I have been saying this. It is wild how much, they, how, like, how they use CG in such a way that it's not so Im immediately obvious that it's, like, distracting. Yeah. Because that's what makes a lot of movies from this era age poorly is just oh, yeah. the really ugly CG, right? Like, But, like, here, I feel like it's handled so well and it looks so good and it makes these movies feel like timeless almost yeah for me that's the, the, the stuff that i just go to that really holds up is like i mean this is the character i knew i really wanted to talk with you about the nightcrawler opening is just a monkey ass like like that action scene like is better than some action scenes i've still seen today it's fucking awesome because nightcrawler is fucking awesome yeah and, and almost Every scene he's in in an X-Men movie is fucking kick-ass as shit. Oh, yeah. He's great in this film. Alan Cumming does such a good job as this character. Yeah. And, I mean, Nightcrawler is just... He's one of the best X-Men. And I, I do know that uh, a certain director who shall not be named actually wanted to have Nightcrawler in the first movie, but he couldn't actually get Alan Cumming, who he was, like, set on being Nightcrawler. Mm -hmm. So he waited... And then for X2, the movie was stuck in development hell so long that Alan Cummings' schedule freed up. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to get him in to play Nightcrawler. Mm -hmm. um, he's not in the I movie mean, he's just as fucking... much as I remembered him being. Like, he's he's in the opening, and then he's around as, like, a side character throughout most of the film. A very, very fun yeah. side character that is very important to the plot. But, like, he doesn't, like, he's not in it as much. But he just steals every scene that he's in. It. Like, he's just... They yeah, really because fundamentally, it. he's just one of the coolest characters in this franchise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I love the religious angle they play with him. Like he's like they they look at him like you still have you still have faith in these humans that they're gonna treat you like with respect. And he's like, well, that's what faith is all about. Like you you need to have a yeah. little faith. Like him and uh, I almost said Rogue Storm's dynamic throughout the film is just really well done. Like she like yeah like I mean they did give. Halle Berry more to do in this film, which I appreciate because Storm is one of my favorite X Men. So just getting to see yeah. her do a lot more, like I always liked her character because she's very like the maternal figure of the X Men, just in general. So yeah. like, getting to see her like really play that more, and to newcomers like Nightcrawler, I just really appreciated that. Yeah, Halle Berry was stellar casting for Storm. Oh, definitely. And I just. I, was, I just think that she's underused in the franchise as a whole. Like, I would love to see more of her character, but right, who knows? Maybe we might see more of her. I don't know. Like, a lot of really good action sequences in the film. Like, we talked about the Nightcrawler one. Like, the first time we really get to see Wolverine use his berserker rage against those soldiers who attack the mansion. Right. Like, dude, that, like, that was awesome. It still holds up. I mean, it's not Logan, but it's still really <laughs> fun. Like, just getting to see him be the best babysitter ever <laughs> right like and his just his dynamic with rogue and her friends and iceman uh, and pyro i also really like if i'm gonna talk about pyro i think we also have to talk about magneto in the same uh, sentence because i like magneto's manipulation cult leader like way of influencing pyro into like joining the brotherhood yeah. You're a god amongst insects like you should that you should not be treated as any lesser like I, oh man he's Again, just Ian McKellen, just serving con. Yeah, I, Ian McKellen I, does incredible there. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that throughout. These... Yeah, say it at least once every time, even in movies he's not in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just just, just remind the people. Uh, just, I just love Magneto's like interactions with the X-Men, because now he's like an ally in this film. Yeah. They're teaming up against uh, 
basically well, Stryker. Right. Which I'm curious, what do you think of Stryker in this film? He's a great villain. He is exactly the kind of villain that they this story needed, oh, right? Because I mean, yeah. the the comic that this is based on was famously very good. Yep. Um, God loves man kills. And Stryker works so well as a villain because it's like Magneto works as a villain. He's always been good as a villain because he's diametrically opposed to Charles, mm -hmm. and this works better in contexts where we are willing to be like, well, maybe Charles is a peaches and roses, right? And when we get to Dark Phoenix, I'll talk a little bit more about that because it's one of the few you like about that movie but super far off mm -hmm. um at any rate what works about this is that the villain is that we're like the reason that we're expected to hate striker is primarily through wolverine yeah. and wolverine is a character where it's like i don't have to get in my ideological feelings about the fact that we're portraying this conflict in a way that's weird and one-sided because fuck that guy yeah. right like <laughs> it's just it's just a very easy comprehensible that's a guy who we have a super clear and uncomplicated reason to fucking hate. Mm -hmm. And when he inevitably dies, it's awesome. Oh, it's so right? Sad. Like that's it's so sad. Yeah. And one thing that I really like about the casting of Brian Cox as the character is that yeah. he's just a guy. Like he's just yeah. like a middle aged, overweight guy. Like he's not like the yeah. big like Arnold Schwarzenegger, big muscly military dude. He's just someone's dad. <laughs> Like, well, yeah, and I mean, that's always been the the, the deal with Stryker, right? Because he's like, he's not a superhero. He's just a really fucked up person in a position of power. Mm -hmm. well, in the <laughs> comics, he's a pastor. Right. Yeah, but in the movie, like, I mean, in the comics, like, his backstory, he was in the military. But, like, in the film, they're just like, well, we're just going to make him military and ignore the uh, whole religious angle. Which, again, it's really weird that they went with God Loves, Man Kills as the second X-Men movie. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's crazy how much they escalate, right? Because they, they start off with, like, a very simple, very classic X-Men story, immediately into God Loves, Man Kill, immediately into, like, Dark Phoenix Saga. I guess you could say that is also a problem, because you half the fun of, like, X-Men is the soap opera of everything building up to those moments. But, like, I think yeah. with this film, like, what it, why it works better than in the sequels is that, like, the whole point of the ending of the last film is, like, uh, Magneto saying to Charles, like, all right, well, we're playing on our field. But what are you going to do when, like, uh, those people go after your kids? And Charles is like, well, I pity the man. I pity the person who, oh, oh God, what is the quote? <laughs> Basically what he says, I wish a motherfucker would. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Which, again, from an ideological standpoint, super weird thing to say, Charles, because what about all of the kids you actively taking care of man are, are they, i guess they're not yours so it's it's cool right like it's fine i, I guess when you put it like that yeah. like, uh, like it's like the hogwarts mentality of like hey we'll bring the fight to the school what yeah it's just it's absolutely crazy because he's like yeah well if anyone tries to come after my kids they, they won't end well and it's like cool but what about all of the other kids charles <laughs> What Charles, we, we need to have a conversation, man, because you're not thinking about the, like, everyone else who you aren't actively protecting. <laughs> what about that mutant boy who's, like, actively, like, allergic to lead? <laughs> yeah. Like, what about that poor kid? <laughs> yeah. I, it's just fucking crazy. <laughs> it's like, All right, Charles, come on. Unintentionally the funniest moment in that movie, because it really illustrates the kind of flaw of Charles's thinking, but I'm not sure that it was, like, meant to. I think they were trying to make it a really cool, badass line, but it just really <laughs> accurately illustrates the reasons that Charles's ideology is flawed. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> God, like, I can't get over that idea. Like, like, some parent hears him say that, like, I am taking my kid out of this school right now. <laughs> like, yeah. You said what? It's just fucking hilarious. But yes, so what I was trying to say before we got sidetracked yeah. was that I think that it's good that they went for Striker as a villain here, yeah. and I think that it's good that they, they illustrate in a lot of ways the way that Zader school that like, kind of stands up for its own and, and such. Mm -hmm. I think they needed to have a movie where Magneto wasn't the villain. I agree. Yeah. Because it would have gotten stale, and I appreciate that they that they go that. He does still some pretty shitty things. Like I yeah, he's that, he's very sinister, but yeah, 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 like him manipulating Pyro and him changing the machine to go after humans instead of yes. Yeah. 
like he still knows what he's doing, but like he, he he's definitely doing the enemy of my enemy is my friend at the moment. And yeah, the moments that we do get to see like the X Men kind of like <laughs> tolerating <laughs> Magneto is really fun. Like the one moment yeah. I really like that's just kind of like a really <laughs> shitty thing that Magneto does is like uh, it's when they're on the plane and uh, they see Rogue with the white streak in her hair now. And he just goes like, "I love what you've done with your hair, darling." And just like, "Oh, you little fucker!" <laughs> oh, God. Like, I yeah. No, like, he's he's still such a bitch, and it's great. <laughs> yeah. I also, I want to take a quick moment to tangent. Speaking of Pyro, okay. I am so glad that they put Iceman in this movie. I really like how they interpret him. Uh-huh. It is fucking hilarious in 2024 to see Iceman played yep. as straight. It's yep. so fucking funny. And it's no fault of this movie, that's just how the character was at the time. Yeah, because they didn't yeah. establish that he was gay for until a few years after this movie came out. Uh-huh. But it, still fucking so funny, especially considering that as we go into X3, they set up a heterosexual love triangle yep. with Iceman. Uh-huh. <laughs> the least heterosexual X-Men in, like, common interpretation of the comics nowadays. Uh-huh. And it's just, it's unbelievably funny. I, I do kind of wonder if that, that like, the Rogue Iceman stuff came up because that was, like, kind of tropes at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, we were seeing that in, in young adult fiction. Oh. Uh, it was a little a little <laughs> bit pre-Hunger Games, but, like, you know what I mean? Like, that we were sort of at the beginning of the sort of late 2000s, early 2020s tidal wave of young adult fiction oh, yeah. that focused on dynamics like that. And part of me wonders if they were trying to get in on that action a little bit. I think, uh, I think so. Especially, like, the one thing that also dates this movie is, like, when they get into the car, like, NSYNC pops up on the on the soundtrack. And Oh, but I love that shit. I, I, it's funny in hindsight, <laughs> but I also really appreciate Wolverine, like, nah. <laughs> yeah. The frosted tips and all that shit is just like, okay, yeah. well, this is very 2000. Like, when you get to those characters, like the kids, the hairdos yeah. really show, like, oh, this is when this film takes place. Yeah, but that's fucking awesome. That's oh, exactly yeah. how it should be, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I love when things are reflective of the time in which they were made. Um, but to, to finish up my, my point about Iceman, easily the funniest possible thing in terms of this movie aging is the scene where he goes home and tries to explain <laughs> to his family that he is a mutant. And it reads very much like him coming out as gay, which I'm sure was intentional, oh, yeah. even though the character was not gay at that time. Uh, I know that um, Ian McKellen helped to write that scene. Yeah, so, like, obviously that was supposed to be allegorical, uh-huh. but it's so funny because I don't even know if they had in mind the fact that Iceman was gay. I don't know. But it's that. I, don't know. I honestly think because of that scene, they made him gay in the comics. Maybe. It did, however, give us my favorite coming out scene in all of fiction, which I don't know if you've read the comic where Iceman is established as gay. I have not. Um... So the way that they do it in the comics is just fucking hilarious. This is a bit of a tangent, but oh, really? basically um, there's like a, a younger version of Iceman because it's like Days of Future Past shit. So they do like little side stories about different characters. And one of them is, is Iceman getting stuck in the future as a younger version of himself. Oh. And he's hanging out with Jean Grey and she reads his mind and is like, oh, you're gay? And he's like, I am? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. Which is fucking hilarious. That is the perfect meta way to do it. <laughs> You're just like, I am? Yeah. And then he thinks about it, and he's like, oh, shit, I am. And that's how we established Iceman is gay. It was because Gene fucking Gray reads his mind. That's amazing. That's so It's funny. so good. Um, yeah. I guess if we want to get into, like, little problems that I have, like, again, like, beloved X-Men characters are just kind of, like, push, pushed to the back in this film. I think the wor- two people that get it the worst are Cyclops and Lady Deathstrike. Yeah. Cyclops more because like the ending of the film hinges on you caring about him and Jean's relationship. And ultimately when Jean sacrifices herself for the team, you really feel it more for Wolverine than you do her actual like husband or boyfriend. I, I don't know where they were. Uh, boyfriend at this point, yeah. Okay. That whole like relationship, I didn't feel much because it's really just like, well, first of all, like Cyclops throughout most of this film, she's like, "Why well, I am my girl, man!" Like, like just being all like bravado and trying to like be all tough and shit. Like, come on, like Cyclops is meant to be like a, a leader and like you know show strength and like command a presence, and that's why Wolverine follows him. 
I mean, they've always had the weird, like, uh, love triangle in the comics, but you buy it more because of, like, you know, Cyclops and Jean have been together, and you see that more before Wolverine ever showed up in the comics. But right. in this film, it, it just doesn't play that well, and, like, ultimately, like, I mean, everybody's always said this, but, like, Cyclops is the weakest aspect of these X-Men films, and that's a really yeah. big... Yeah, well, I feel like the person who wrote these movies just didn't fucking like him. I agree, like, it just... Well, first of all, they get cinema's favorite cuck to play him, uh, James Marsden, and, like, he's just, like, he does a good job, like, for what he's given, but he just comes off as this weird, like, dude, bro, like, they make a point to, like, say, like, oh, we're stealing Cyclops' car, so there's this, like, weird dick measuring contest throughout the whole film <laughs> between him and Wolverine. Yeah. It's, I just, it, that <laughs> element of the film just doesn't work for me anymore, where as a kid, I was just like, yeah, Wolverine, you're the main character, you get the girl. Now I'm like, Wolverine, she said no. Back the fuck up. Yeah, he's like a, Wolverine is definitely very creepy. It's so funny in, in the, the first movie, too, whenever Jean is, like, trying to heal him up, and she's he's like, ah, oh, I couldn't wait to get my shirt off, huh? <laughs> After he, like, knows she has a man, and it's like, damn, dude, are you, like, that down bad? Like, you're Hugh Jackman. If you need, like, sex, man, you don't have to hit on this random woman. Storm is right there. <laughs> Well, I just well, hold on. Maybe we shouldn't <laughs> say he could get sex anywhere when he's out of school. Let's make that very clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you all you have to do is leave campus, man. Like it's not <laughs> it's not hard. You just go like ten minutes to the nearest bar and you can solve this issue. You don't need to keep hitting on this woman who is obviously uninterested. And they make this whole dynamic so much grosser in X three. Oh, My okay. agonized screaming will wait for that review. Oh, I can't but wait. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, special special anger. In my heart for that movie. I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just... It's weird. It's its unpleasant. I feel like the worst things that this movie gets into are the parts where it's trying to sort of be similar to genre conventions of its day. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's just... It's awkward as hell, and I don't love it. Yeah, that's kind of my biggest problem with the film. But, but like, with Lady Deathstrike, it's also just kind of like... She's the tough woman that Stryker has... But, like, none of the characteristics of her in the comics. She doesn't even have... She, I think she has, like, one line in the film. Like, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Didn't they Didn't they bring her up more in that movie where Wolverine goes to Japan? Isn't she in She's that? Not. Or am I mistaken? That really? That character, who is from that run of the comics, is not in that movie. Which is that's super wild. Weird. But, I will say this, and this is not really a spoiler because they do show it in the trailer. She is returning for Deadpool and Wolverine. That's cool. That you could see there's a shot in the trailer where, like, Ant-Man's helmet opens up, or, like, the giant Ant-Man skull opens up, and you could see, yeah. like, a row of characters, and you get, like, Azazel, and you get uh, her character, and you could tell it's her because she's wearing the black leather onesie and silver claws. Right. Which, by the way, I don't mind the change of her just having, like, long fingernails instead of, like, those really weird, like, giant hands. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I like this whole idea of, like, oh her fingernails are just kind of extend and when they're not like extended they make really really weird like bone crunching sounds because they're in her fingers like i think that's a pretty cool like like idea of like explaining because i never explain that with wolverine of like wait how can he move his wrists if he's got these giant fucking blades in him and, yeah uh, i like that change um but i guess the thing i really want to talk about with you i wanted to get your opinion on and i will say i did not get this this is not my own thought but I wanted to get your opinion on it. Um, it's from a new Rockstars video where someone pointed out that the character of Jason Stryker, when they are like inside Professor X's head, uh, they project themselves as a little girl when in reality they're a like an right. adult man. Some li- some use that as a way of saying like, oh, the character is trans. I don't believe that's what the writers were intending. I think like they were bringing up the idea of, like, oh, a small, innocent girl compared to, like, a gaunt, lobotomized adult man. I can see where the writers were going with that, but it is interesting to point out that idea, though, of, like, this character could be trans. Yeah. Well, so what I was going to say about that is I think that it is, as it always is, running in circles to debate about possible, like, binary, is this character trans, yes, no, Mm -hmm. in a story. Like, I think that there can be value to interpret in certain characters that way. I think that there are certainly discussions to be had, but I think that spending any amount of time actually 
this character definitively is versus isn't trans is ridiculous. But I do think what what you're you're kind of knocking on there in a really good way is that when we look at this story, we look at how can the allegory of transness or the understanding of transness add like what what dimensions does it bring to this narrative? Mm-hmm. And specifically with Jason's narrative, I do feel like it it brings an an element right, essentially in the sense of Jason being like sort of depersoned mm-hmm. uh, in in that that sense by his father, uh, mm-hmm. right? Like we we get this understanding of Jason not as a person, but but as but as a tool, as a as a means to an end for his father. And so when we see the way that he he portrays himself. Whether or not that's meant to be an allegory for literal transness is sort of irrelevant in the the larger face of the issue of this is a person who clearly does not feel at home in their own body. And that idea of dissociation from one's body and, and sort of separation from the physical form and from these sort of intentions that other people have for you are sort of universal narrative language that does tend to coincide with transness. And I think that there is an element of associating that with transness that I think is, is, is relevant, but that would be kind of my, my take on that issue. If that makes sense. I just wanted your opinion on this because I heard the theory and I thought it was really interesting. And even though I don't think that's what the writers were intending initially, I think that what makes this film in this series good as a whole is that like the idea of these characters who represent various figures of like members of like civil rights movements or any person has ever feel persecuted or yeah like they don't belong like can relate to the X Men in some way and that theme can still like be said. The idea of the X Men will never die. And yeah. I think that's what's really important to like at least bring up with like the allegory overall overall. Yeah, I agree. And I think that as long as you know, we live in this sort of situation and system that generates people who aren't able to, you know, sort of fully stand up for themselves or aren't able to live like right as long as oppression and, and sort of dissension and, and these things exist, the X Men will always be relevant because they represent such a multifaceted dimension of resistance and, you know, not succumbing under pressure and, and finding strength and identity as opposed to having it stamped out of you. And I feel like those themes are just so eternal and universal that regardless of how you want to interpret things, you can always find yourself in an X-Men story. Mm-hmm. You know, I do have one other thing that's a really like dumb, like uh, criticism to say, I know I was trying to sound smart earlier, but this is just one thing I don't like about this film. I hate this title. <laughs> oh, dude, X2, X-Men United. That's not your favorite title ever. It doesn't spark joy in your heart. It's, if you want to talk about something that dates a film, is like the idea of like just 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 call it X Men Two. Yeah. Like, like yeah, or call like, it X Men United. Yeah, X Men United is an awesome title. Like I love the tag, like yeah. the X Two colon X Men United. Like, but no, when you look this movie up on IMDb, it's just X Two. Yeah. Which really pisses me off. Yeah, just, it's like, a dumb fucking name. Like it's just for such like a really yeah. well put together film for the most part. Just like a really like. Oh, we're gonna be really cool and rad. Like, let's call it X two. And it's crazy because yeah. did they call it X three the last stand, or did they just call it X Men? Because I always last stand. <laughs> right, which is how they should have handled this. It should have been X Men, X Men United, and then X Men the Last Stand. I agree. Don't number shit. Numbering shit is dumb. Numbering shit is the death blow that will ruin your movie. I kind of like numbering. I I I, I like the idea of numbering stuff. Like I I am I am a big fan of of subtitling things. I don't mind like a number than a subtitle. Like that's not my problem. That's that's fair. Yeah, I just hate this title. The title specifically. <laughs> it's just dumb. Yeah. I don't disagree. Is that all we want to say about this film? It's good. It is a great second beat in a trilogy uh, of two really fantastic movies. Ruined by a third film. <laughs> yes. Next time on X Marathon, you will hear me in pain, in agony, in suffering. Well, that's all I really have all to right. say about this film. Uh, thank you guys yeah. for uh, listening to us. I have a lot of fun talking about uh, X2. God, I hate the title. X-Men United. Next week, as Emily po- pointed out, we will be covering X-Men The Last Stand. I think that's going to be a very interesting review. Hopefully we could get Joelle on that review yes. as well. That way <laughs> she can witness Emily becoming the Dark Phoenix herself. <laughs> 
Yes. Yes, I will be I will be angry. <laughs> there will be there will be steam coming out of my ears like a 1940 cartoon character. Oh, I can't wait. That's going to be so much fun. So yeah, um Subscribe, uh, click that bell icon so you can stay up to date on all of our videos that we'll be releasing. If you like this video, hit that like button. If you want to share this video around because we said something smart for once, which is very rare on this channel. Very rare. Very rare. Hit that share button. Share it with all your friends, your enemies, your homophobic uncle. <laughs> yeah. Share it to him. <laughs> if you have a homophobic uncle, share this video that has a trans woman in it. He'll love it. <laughs> if you never wanted to like piss your uncle off more, this video is the perfect yeah. one for them. All right. Also, uh, you can share this video with your favorite Brian Singer hater because fuck Brian Singer. Yep. As, Just wanted to, to reiterate. In all of our videos that have Brian Singer directing the movie that we're talking about, fuck Brian Singer. We we will not tell you why. Just look it up on your own. Sorry, but that's just, we're not going to cover that. That's just a lot of... We like our dollar signs green, not yellow. And... <laughs> <laughs> right now, there is no dollar sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if you want Max to make money, also subscribe to the Million Dollar Media Patreon. Thank you, where we get to talk more <laughs> about <laughs> things that are not safe for work. Yeah, yes, that's... if you want to see those dollar signs turn red, or content that would make those dollar signs turn red, subscribe to the Million Dollar Media Patreon, where you can get unedited cuts of our videos, as well as uh, more NSFW versions of our shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all we gotta say. Please keep watching. C-Max, I can chill too. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all we gotta say. Hope you all have a good day. Bye!